Medieval bestiaries are a family of lavishly illuminated manuscript encyclopedias nominally focused on zoology. In practice, they are a mixture of natural history, cryptozoology, and Aesopian animal fables, making them essentially the medieval equivalent of this channel. Today I'm going to be trying to rank the first 35 animals in the Aberdeen bestiary. My criteria are magical power, overall vibe, and a category I invented called tangentiousness, which is a measure of how good I think the tangent that I ended up going on after reading the entry happened to be. We've got 35 animals to rank today, so feel free to use the chapter markers to skip around and split it up however you like. I have to thank David Badke. Without his incredibly vast database, The Medieval Bestiary, this wouldn't be possible. It includes 425 manuscripts, most of which have annotation and commentary and images. Link in the description, you should definitely take a look. The Aberdeen Bestiary is the one that I selected from that massive deluge of options, and the reasons are pretty straightforward. It's large and very complete. The parts that are missing can be found in the closely related Ashmole Bestiary because they were copied from a similar source. And finally, and this might be a little hard to understand, but it's sort of a true neutral example of this literary genre, here's a visualization. All of these depict the same animal. Can you even guess which one it is? Working with the Aberdeen will give us a midpoint for comparison, but don't worry, I will be showing you all of the misfits and surprisingly good boys that we could have missed along the way. Bear in mind, the facts I'm about to share aren't necessarily facts, per se. That is, they don't necessarily indicate what people in the past believed were true about each of these animals. A random shepherd might not have made a distinction between the claim that wolves are fast and that they can freeze a person by glaring at them, but that doesn't mean that all of this was meant to be taken literally, or even most of it. The bulk of the word count here is devoted to these Aesopian animal fables that are meant as Christian moral instruction. Saying that this literally represents what people believed about animals is a little bit like saying modern 21st century Americans believe cats can rise from the dead by citing Puss in Boots' The Last Wish people in the past knew about metaphors. I want to direct your attention to this quadrilobe mandorla. Mandorla is Italian for almond. It refers to the frame around Christ here. As you might have expected, these bestiaries include a mixture of magical and mundane critters. We're stopping here to check out these four. You might be tempted to call that a griffin and maybe a lamassu, an angel, and like a bird, I guess. But these are cherubim. And here's the thing. Angels, when they appear to mortals, usually say, fear not, and there should be a reason for that, because they are terrifying. The angels that appear in Revelation 4-6 are based off of Ezekiel's visions, and Ezekiel is very clear that these should be less soft boys with wings and more intersecting fiery wheels with wings, four faces each, that are entirely covered in eyes. Each one had four faces. The first face was that of an ox, the second was that of a human, the third that of a lion, and the fourth that of an eagle. Their entire body, their rims, their spokes, their wings, and the wheels. The wheels of the four of them were full of eyes all round. Like in Bloodborne, E-tier. The Aberdeen, like many bestiaries, is based on an earlier work, in this case the 7th century text Etymology by Isidore of Seville, which is not a bestiary, but a proper encyclopedia, covering everything from grammar to rhetoric to theology all the way to natural history, where it will primarily cite, friend of the channel, Pliny the Elder. I like that. Today etymology is the study of word origin, but Isidore means it in a more universal sense, kind of like word origin astrology. So. A universal way of determining some sort of hidden historical or theological truth by uncovering the origin of the name of the thing itself. Whatever an animal is called tells you something about what God thinks about it. The name beast applies, strictly speaking, to lions, panthers, and tigers, wolves and foxes, dogs and apes, and all other animals which vent their rage with tooth or claw except snakes. They are called beasts for the force with which they rage. They are called wild because they enjoy the natural liberty and are borne along by their desires. Isidore's etymological classification system survives spiritually today in taxonomy, which does tell us that a hidden truth is revealed by a particular animal's name. Their binomial, or scientific name, reveals their ancestry, where they came from, by categorizing them into clades, or groups that are defined as a bunch of things that are all closely related in some way. In fact, wild beasts as a macro classification system still exists in the subphylum Therapsida, which includes all mammals and the Gorgonops and wolf lizards, our cousins, as well as an order of bumply gentlemen called the Astemnosuchids, and one of my all-time favorite animals, moss chops. I just love the contrast between his thick front legs and his little tiny head. I don't know. 
the line's actually missing from the Aberdeen. It was cut out to put into a locket or maybe a small piece of art, possibly by King Henry VIII. We're going to use the Ashmole image, which shows three lions, the tall, fierce one, the short, peaceful one, and an unnamed blue third lion. As far as powers go, lions are swift and strong, and they can breathe life into their cubs, which sounds great, except they have to do that because they're always stillborn. Lions are sometimes shared on Twitter under hashtag not a lion, and it, it's true the medieval illuminators weren't always drawing very, let's say, accurately. In fact, it seems like sometimes they just get fed up or frustrated and default to an animal they're more familiar with, mostly dogs, horses, and the occasional shoggoth. I've decided to call this Sinofabulation, Sino meaning dog, because it is the most common thing they default to, but I will be using it to refer to any of this kind of confabulation of two animals, one that's more familiar. Stop the video. Hi, I'm Encyclopedia Green, I do all the research and editing here, and I'm stepping in to finish that thought that Enchiridion just sort of left hanging in the air there. I have three increasingly wild examples of Sinofabulation. This is not a dog. I mean, it is, right? That's the substance of the point. The Illuminator drew a dog. But this is supposed to be a lizard. So is this horse, actually. A chameleon. Specifically, the Latin says, chameleon non habit unum colorum. The chameleon has no one color. Maybe the Illuminator saw like a camel lion and was trying to draw like a horse that had a little bit more lion to it and thought that that's like what a camel is. And those are just three different things. I don't know, it doesn't matter. This scallop starts off okay. I mean, it at least looks like a shelled mollusk, right? Actually, looking at it now, it's sort of an eerie reflection of Slowbro's tail mouth guy, which is inexplicably supposed to evolve from a shelter, which is a scallop, right? I'm burning the lead. This is also a dog. So, just to be clear, this isn't about making fun of these drawings based on some modern standard of photorealism. I found hundreds of these like wonderful, deeply human illuminations to share with you today, and a lot of them are dogs by accident. That's not good or bad, it's just true. Also, a little bit of bookkeeping, and Kyridian does not write scripts, so I will have to pop back in here and there just to finish some of the takes he didn't do. But let's get back to the video already. <clears throat> nope, sorry, stop the video again. I found an example a bit late in the process, and my mind unfolded like a blossoming lotus flower trying to parse it. I am not kidding or exaggerating when I say you could probably write a PhD thesis on this next image. Shield your minds, kids. We're about to get non-Euclidean. I present what has to be the world's only example of hexa sinofabulation or sana or sexa whatever you call basics is definitely the correct one let's start with the pure semantic intention of this image the thing that it's supposed to be but clearly is not this is a giraffe now keen-eyed viewers might notice this particular giraffe is three different colors has a long mane of hair and the body of a camel the name giraffe is derived from the Arabic, but the original English name actually came from the ancient Greek. It's just camelos partilus camelopard, a camel-like creature with leopard-like spots. Except, according to those same ancient Greeks, the leopard is, recursively, another hybrid. Half lion, half pard. Leo, pard, leopard. More on that later. Does this head look right to you? Because it doesn't look right to me, and we don't actually have to guess about this. This text, De Nature and Bloom, is a full bestiary. We can see how this artist depicts a lion, leopard, and a pard, and none of these cats are a good match. Look at that snoot and those long pointed ears. The head is distinctly canine, and it seems to have been a deliberate choice on the artist's part. Now, we could stop here, pentasinofabulatedly, but I'm not going to, because this is not a dog, and this is not even a leopard. This is a panther. How could I possibly know that? What even is the difference between a leopard and a panther? Okay, so, so panther either refers to the genus containing lions, tigers, jaguars, and leopards, or colloquially to a leopard with unusually dark fur. Yes, black panthers have spots. This is all irrelevant because these were drawn in 1350. The artist did not know about phylogeny or genetics, or that pards don't exist. We'll get to it soon. Big cats are usually colored red or brown, with two major exceptions. The tiger and the panther are both described in many texts as having rainbow colored fur. More on that later. Also, this is the Bloom Tiger, this is the Bloom Panther. Ding, ding, ding. This image is a self-reflecting fractal hybrid of six different animals, a giraffe drawn as a camel dog, where the dog part is a sinofabulated leopard, which is the hybrid of two cats, which was mistakenly drawn with a distinct coloration of a panther, a fourth different cat. Now we can proceed with the video. As far as ranking lions go, I think being able to bring anything back from the dead, even if it's fairly limited, is pretty cool, and lions are very powerful, so I'm gonna give them an A tier. Ah, the tiger. Now, I think it is fair to say a tiger has distinctive markings, which is what the text tells us. The text also says that tiger derives from a word for arrow. 
I think that people don't realize those were supposed to be connected ideas, because I think you can describe a stripe as sort of an arrow-like marking. So Latin has mostly free word order, which means you can shuffle the words up and retain the same meaning. And also, they're not necessarily using any punctuation at all, depending on the period. It's very possible these two sentences were once one sentence that were misunderstood. Although, of course, illuminators, they can just go off the rails no matter how well you describe an animal and sign a fabulated into a goat or this long pig. The story here is about a mother tiger whose cub is being taken, and the person who stole it is throwing a mirrored ball to distract her, which she then sees her reflection, mistakes it for the cub, and then starts to nurse on the reflection. It's supposed to be something about pride. I don't know. I can't make heads or tails of it. Tigers don't really have any powers aside from being fast, um, but I do really like that they're rainbow spotted, so I'm going to give them a good C tier. We've arrived at our first mythical creature, and the most boring cryptid of all time, the pard. So. The pard is a lion-like creature with spots that's not a leopard. For reasons entirely beyond my ken, ancient writers were convinced that leopards were these degenerate, sinful half-lions trapped in between a pure lion-like existence and something else. In order to explain how they come about, they confabulated a new creature that a lion could mate with. The mixture of two cats, Leo, pard. pard. Leopard. The pard's only power is to make lions super mad by hooking up with their wives, which is undoubtedly extremely funny. I also really like the face, and it tickles me to the extreme that all pards are male, which is why they have to hook up with lionesses in the first place, which means, like, where do pards come from, guys? You invented these to explain where a different cat was coming from. That's, That's an infinite, infinite regress. regress. S tier. S -tier. Something I haven't mentioned yet is that a lot of these animals have canonical enemies. Uh, a critter they hate or fear. The lion's enemy is the leontophone, which as far as I know is never described in any bestiary. The panther's enemy is the dragon. Sick. In addition to that, panthers are rainbow-colored, and their breath is a sweet perfume which attracts all the animals the world over. That kind of means they have access to every other animal power. I like this image in particular, because it, you can't tell which one is the dragon at first. Anyway, by being the Charles Xavier of the medieval bestiary, they're sort of automatically s here. Elephants are one of the hardest animals for scribes to get right. You get a fair amount of, so like it's a tall horse then, and some monsters that cannot be explained. I call this one kinky boots, and in defense of this one, it is what I would think you meant if you told me to draw an animal with a long nose. Elephants are smart, having a long memory. They have a hatred of dragons, a fear of mice, and possess the quality of mercy. They also don't have knees for some reason, which means in order to sleep they have to lean against trees. And since conventional weapons cannot harm them, hunters will cut notches into those trees, allow it to collapse under the elephant's weight, and kill it while it's helpless. This is ultimately attributable to, friend of the channel, Pliny the Elder. And in fact, all of these ideas exist into the modern day, including Pliny's weird knee thing. Thanks, Pliny. This is an astonishing coincidence, but I just read this exact story, the whole knee thing, in Fearsome Critters of the Lumberwoods from like 1910. Um, so in that, it's attributed to the Hoogag. Not the Hodag, the one-time prank that saved the entire town of Rhinelander, Wisconsin. No, 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 this is the Hoogag. The Hoogag. It's a very tall animal with a long chin. Fearsome critters are a particular type of cryptid. They're sort of a 19th century American ghost story cryptid specifically. So lumberjacks invented them around the campfire either as jokes or to sort of razz on the new kid. I'm not sure if this is relatable content, but I actually think this might have happened to me. I have very dim memories of being sent by some camp counselors on a snipe hunt. A snipe is a fearsome critter that's very easy to catch if you know the trick of it. It will approach you if you're not looking at it. So then, you know, you go to the woods, you stand with your back to the woods, and you wait for a long time until you freaked yourself out, and then the counselors would have jumped out and scared me. I don't think I fell for it, and I feel like I would remember the cascading consequences of that if it had happened. I was actually, I was expelled from that camp, actually. Just for that, I'm docking it down to A tier. Ugh, elephants. Try harder next time. Okay, fact time. Beavers are hunted for their musk, which is a natural fixative, a substance that's used in food and perfume to take two different scents or flavors and turn them into one thing. I have had mulled wine with fixatives in it, and it is wild. Imagine tasting like black pepper, cinnamon, and red wine without any flavor dominating the others, like not in sequence, all at once, like biting into a fruit that just tastes like those three things. The Aberdeen doesn't seem to know what a musk gland is. It thinks that beavers were sought for their testicles, and, well, 
scribes sort of fixated on that image. You can always tell if you're looking at a beaver because they will be trying to... Well, when it knows that a hunter is pursuing it, it bites off its testicles and throws them in the hunter's face, and taking flight escapes. But if, once again, another hunter is in pursuit, the beaver rears up and displays its sexual organs. When the hunter sees that it lacks testicles, he leaves it alone. Thus, every man who heeds God's commandment and wishes to live chastely should cut D-tier. Ibex knows one trick, but it's like a pretty good one. They can jump off an entire mountain and land on their horns and then just stay like that. Good enough for at least a C-tier. Finally, some good powers. So, hyenas can mimic human voices, stop dogs from barking, paralyze any creature by walking around it in a circle, and you can use their eyes to cast prognostication magic. They also have this elaborate ruse they perform, which I will not be explaining because it involves vomit. They have one last power, though, and it is both extremely based and sort of true. They're said to be able to change their sex at will. In real life, the spotted hyena female has a very large clitoris, which it uses as a pseudo-penis to top, and that is a very important part of their extremely sophisticated social culture. In fact, they have the most sophisticated culture of any carnivoran. Yeah, more than wolves or lions. They're more comparable to, like, Circopithecine primates like baboons. Both have enlarged frontal cortexes, complex social rankings, and a matriarchal culture. Like I said, Based. Hyenas are also said to mate with lions to produce the mythical crocoda, which is, in reality, the spotted hyena, making it the second ordinary spotted animal this book proposes must be the result of an unholy lion marriage. In Asia, an animal is found which men call bonacon. Its horns are convoluted, curling back on themselves in such a way that if anyone comes up against it, he is not harmed. But the protection which its forehead denies this monster is furnished by its bowels. For when it turns to flee, it discharges fumes from the excrement of its belly over a distance of three acres, the heat of which sets fire to anything it touches. This book hates monkeys for some reason. It calls them ugly and horrible, uh, specifically their butts, which is very funny to me. The reason the ape is always carrying two babies is because she has one that she loves and one that she hates. And she'll carry love baby in her arm when she's chased, but hate baby's got to cling to her back. Of course, if she grows tired, she has to drop love baby, but you can't get rid of hate baby. Hate baby is like sin or the devil or something. I don't know. The book posits the existence of five kinds of apes. This covers sort of the first three, so that's the Circopiths, which have tails, the Cynocephalus, which are the dog-headed men of northern Africa, posited by friend of the channel Pliny the Elder. That's the same kind of thing as my boy Saint Christopher, dope. And lastly, Sphinxes, which actually seems to refer to mandrels, or at least that's the only thing I've ever heard it tested. I, I don't know where that comes from. There are two more kinds of ape, which are actually the same kind of ape, but that's the next entry. This one makes me uncomfortable and gets a B tier. Satyrs, ones with beards, ones without. Those are the last two kinds of ape. That wand they're holding is called the Thyrsus. It's used in their lustful and disorderly revels. Ceteros Fasi Admodum Grata, which is Latin for Satyr got a good face. Hey, something about Latin. It's not one language, but many, like all languages, right? So there's church Latin, which is boring, and new Latin, which was invented by scientists in the 18th century so they could talk about penguins fucking without women finding out. Okay, that's not why they invented new Latin, but it's something they used it for. Basic Latin, the ancient Latin, is generally high Latin because it's based on the writings of fancy bitches like Aristotle. There's Another version of the language, one that's poorly attested, which is generally referred to as vulgar Latin, the common people's tongue, and we just don't have a lot of writing that's in that language at all. But one work we do have is the Satyricon. The Satyricon is a rambling, episodic story narrated by the hero Inculpius, while he and his boyfriend Giton get into and out of a series of erotic misunderstandings. They go to parties, argue at the public market, discuss werewolves and zodiac signs. So it's gay self-insert OC slash fiction from the ancient world. Like, like exactly that. And the thing is, classicists, which historically have been a little resistant, let's call it, to including all of the queerness of the ancient world, have to refer to the Satyricon because it's one of the only things we have that describes the life of an ordinary Roman citizen at all. Satyrs join the eel, the Asheloth, and the Ossifrage in my growing collection of unsung queer animal icons. The satyr gets... I'm sorry, wait, you don't know what I mean? Right. 
You've probably heard this axle auto. Uh, that's fine. That's pretty much the standard American English pronunciation. It's just that the name actually comes from the Nahuatl languages, where X's denote the SH sound and the digraph TL is used for the voiceless alveolar lateral affricate. Basically a T sound with extra aspiration at the end there. Do you have to say it that way? No. Live your best life. This is me living mine. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. You were asking why the ossifrage is a queer icon. They're a bright pink vulture that eats bones. What am I missing? <laughs> it couldn't be possibly. Sound off in the comments if you're the ossifrage kind of gay. Satyrs, you won me over. Get your button to A tier. Deer are very cool. Um, they're said to change their feeding ground for love, and in doing so, support one another. But I know what you're here for. You want to know about the magic abilities. Well, first of all, completely immune to the poison condition, and they can't contract any disease that would cause a fever. They can also cast Cause Fear once per season on serpents. Uh, that sounds really niche, but it would work on dragons. I don't know, I've never seen a seasonal cooldown before. The other spell-like abilities don't even have cooldowns at all, they just require special ingredients. The herb Dittany lets them cast Cure Wounds on themselves. I, I think it's fine, you can't upcast it. By eating a snake, though, they can cast Greater Restoration on themselves and reduce their age by 1d8 years. Again, it's like not too powerful, but like, okay. I suspect the designer would say, this isn't overpowered because there's all those neat limitations. And it's true, they are neat, but that's sort of the problem. It's overbalanced. You've got too much stuff going on and all of it's really difficult to use. It's okay to have one cool, powerful thing instead, like pick a lane and go with it. Wait a second, this is definitely a different project. What am I talking about? I'm back, and unlike the host, I remember what the video is about. Deer have very unique powers and they experience romantic love. But there's, like, too much else going on here. The whole is less than the sum of its parts, making them perfect for B-tier. Goats have really good eyesight, and they can always tell if someone who's approaching is, like, a hunter or a traveler, which I suspect is pretty good for a goat. This is another common mistake. The wild goat has all of the vision talent of the domestic goat, and they can do the deer thing where they cast cure wounds on themselves with Dittany. I think it kind of just makes the domestic goat and the deer less special without really adding anything. <laughs> Goats seem to be split, because humans tend to perceive animals very differently when we own them versus when they live in the wild. I want to rank them separately. Wild goat, you're getting a D, because I can't prove that you plagiarized your work here, but I'm on to you. It's sus. Do people still say sus? Oh dear. Monoceros is Latin for one horn, so this is our unicorn. The earliest source I could find attesting the creature is I know a I said Greek. I was just going to pop in from time to time to fill in some gaps, and that's still broadly the plan. And also, to end Kyridian's credit, he filmed this part. Like, he did it, he just did a bad job. Like, he did it bad. I'm gonna try to do it better. Um, where do unicorns come from? Well, once upon a time, there was a Greek named Theseus who saw a rhinoceros somewhere in northern India. And when that story was shared, artists sinofabulated it into a creature that was also a horse. That's basically the whole story about how the unicorn got its shape. It's also not an explanation. Like, why are unicorns healers who hang out with virgins and live in secret glades in the woods? I think a strong case here can be made that these characteristics all basically originate with the old Celtic faiths. To understand how, we'll have to try and fail to understand those old Celtic faiths. Leber Gabarla Eren is one of the best primary sources we have on Irish history. It's a creation story that also chronicles the earliest centuries after Ireland was settled. We really don't know much about pre-Christian Ireland, and without this text we'd know even less. Which is a huge bummer, because it's made up. As in, it's literally Christian fanfiction, presented as real history in order to replace the truth. While much of the content is connected to the old faiths, the book itself is a direct sequel to Noah's Flood. So characters, themes, events, they might all be genuine, but they also might be made up in order to tie into the Bible. And even knowing this, we can't ignore it. Not only because of the paucity of similar sources, we really don't have good alternatives, or because of the fact that it was taken seriously as history for so long, almost a thousand years, but also just because, like, again, some of this is genuine. We have no choice but to try and fail to understand. Tragically, this is a pretty common situation. In fact, in every example that I can think of where Christians are the primary stewards um, of the history of another people, they will recontextualize those people's deities as either demons, ordinary historical figures, or magical spirit people, in some cases all three, like the Tuatha Dé Danann, which are, for our purposes, the Irish pantheon. They were probably part of many Celtic traditions, and all we really have left now are these fragments hidden between the lines of Christian stories. One example will have to suffice. 
The Morrigan is a tripartite Celtic goddess usually composed of three sisters. Her domains are death, battle, and delicious stew. We have a bunch of names for these sisters, and a bunch of characters which might once have been understood as goddesses of some form or another. Some names are probably a Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus situation, different names for the same figure, while others are a Hashem, Yahweh, Elohim situation, different figures with common historical roots. I'm interested in a third, weirder possibility, one that exists because of the unique challenges of studying this arena of history, the the Morrigan Maeve Morgan Le Fay situation. Queen Maeve is one of the heads of the Morrigan. She's in the cattle raid of Cooley, which is to Ireland with the Iliadist degrees. Queen Maeve is that story's protagonist, Cucullin stands log off. Morgan Le Fay is not in that, she's from Arthurian lore, she's King Arthur's sister, and like Arthur himself, she might be a pseudo-historical figure derived from some kind of ancient deity or some combination of things. She's the most derived of these three, the most modern. Here she is, fighting the Avengers. <laughs> my soul has left my body. Are these women supervillains, mythical heroes, historical figures, or goddesses? The answer, maddeningly, is yes. This is Queen Maeve's tomb. It's a real Neolithic burial site. Asking whether or not she's actually buried there isn't a coherent question, because like, who's she? Maeve isn't one figure. Our record of the stories about her and how they developed, it was just replaced. What we have left is this complex web of intentionally ambiguous connections, any bit of which might be a true remnant of the old ways, a newer tradition derived from those old ways, or some bishop's self-insert OC. My point is that things like historical figures, mythical heroes, and fairies are usually some kind of recontextualized incarnation of an older tradition. If you'd like to hear more about how this happens, um, this is basically the whole thing about my video on Santa Claus. These Celtic gods, we don't know much, but we do know they were tutelary. That is, they were tied to a particular place and actively involved in the lives of its people, like Roman house gods, Greek nymphs, or, not for nothing, the gods of the Abrahamic faiths. And I, that's not a dig at Catholicism either. Hashem, the god of the Bible, was a tutelary mountain god, a guy who lived in a place. He had hands, a nose, and a voice. You could go talk to him. You could wrestle him. But I digress. <sighs> to summarize. A guy saw a rhinoceros. His account led to sinofabulated art of a horned horse. At the same time elsewhere, the Celtic phase were being suppressed, revised, and replaced with Christian alternatives. Stories of deities protecting their people and their homes, literal locations in the wilderness, were reimagined as comparatively mundane fairy folk living in the same places. Christian morals seeped in, most notably their weird obsessive association between virginity and individual moral worth. So you end up with a horse with one horn that's said to live in the nearby woods and protects virgins from harm. That's, That's how, how you make, make a unicorn. Bears give birth to unformed cubs, which they then have to shape with their mouth in order to make them alive. It's like a homunculus spell, I guess. This is proposed as the reason why they hibernate. Would you be surprised to hear that this is one of the most accurate descriptions in the book? Okay, so bears obviously don't shape their babies like a homunculus spell. And also, I just want to note, if you spent several months shaping your baby and you just ended up with another bear, that shows a lack of creativity. Or I guess it kind of verifies my friend Mark's hypothesis, which is that if you took any random child and told them to draw the best animal, they would probably on average draw a bear. Bears are like cool, and they're cute, and they're also simple. They max out all three parts of the design triangle. Anyway, bears hibernate primarily because of food reliability. If it's winter and they aren't sure that they're going to be able to eat enough, they will become less active so they have to eat less. If they're in a place where they're fed year-round, like a zoo, they will stop hibernating unless they get pregnant in which case they do it anyway. Also, baby bears are born altricial, which means they are completely dependent on their mothers in order to survive. So in a sense, the mother does have to hibernate in order to shape the bear into a baby cub. That's pretty great. Uh, B. <laughs> As a reminder, the Lucrota is the degenerate hybrid of a lion and a hyena. Leo, crocoat, crocoat being Latin for hyena. It is the fastest of any animal, which would be enough to get on the Justice League. Its other power is stranger. Instead of teeth, it has two large shearing bones, one in the upper and lower jaws. As far as I know, the last time we saw this adaptation in particular was in the late Devonian period with the placoderms. This is Dunkleosteus, one of the coolest things, really, and the animal with the strongest bite force of anything before or since. Now, there has to be a reason for that, because natural selection is perfectly capable of reducing a feature just as it is enhancing it, and having a bite force that strong would come with a lot of costs. What drove this particular adaptation? As a point of comparison, 
two of the biggest clades that were predating at the time are either cephalopods or eurypterids. Cephalopods, like the Orthocerus, which was about six meters long, or the eurypterids, like Jacleopteris, at about three meters. In both cases, you have these very large, powerful animals that can't really break anything. Cephalopods do have beaks today, but that happened maybe 200 million years later than this. It might have been earlier, but that's the earliest I could find any fossils. Whereas Eurypterids are like any arthropod. They have a series of modified legs, which are used to tear food apart, but nothing that can really crush a shell. As a result, most animals that were being preyed upon developed a lot of armor. This is where you get shelled mollusks, like the nautiloids, but also the armored fish, like the placoderms. So when Dugliosteus came about with this incredibly overpowered jaw, we went from armor being a general tool that worked against almost any predator to one that did not work at all against the most important one. And therefore, the armor just ended up slowing you down. This is when fish developed the ability to swim more quickly, and you see a large amount of diversification in a fairly short period of time, geologically speaking. What I'm trying to say is that you wouldn't have an animal that is both the fastest and these like large shearing bone jaws like the Lucrota. Phylogenetically speaking, those two adaptations are sort of opposed to each other. The parander is some kind of deer that is capable of changing color. Most people seem to think that it was probably a caribou or reindeer. Um, this makes a lot of sense. It's a robust deer. It's just kind of a thicker, stronger animal. The color changing, admittedly, isn't a thing that reindeer do. But there might be some truth to this. Um, Historically speaking, scientists have had a lot of trouble classifying different reindeer species because they tend to have fairly similar profiles and even organizations for their horns. Those are the easiest ways to tell two animals apart. Often, the only difference between two subspecies will be the color of the coat. Therefore, it, it would be possible to be out in the woods and see two separate reindeer that looked basically identical, except they were a different color. This is speculation, of course. I'm getting a little tired, actually. Um, I'm going to just take a quick break. I mean, obviously, it won't affect you, but I'll, I'll be back in a second. <clears throat> Thank you for waiting. I'm, the stream's gonna start back up in a second. We're gonna talk about all my favorite albums. Just, just give that a second. Is that what we were doing? I, I thought we were doing something else. <clears throat> okay. Where were we? Yeah, okay. It's a Hit is the song that got me interested in music in the first place. I went and found more adventurous on someone's shared iTunes playlist and listened to it front to back. First time I'd ever really done that. Honestly, if I had to think about it, I feel like if I had to choose one album to be like the first album I ever just listened to all the way, it might it might still be more adventurous. I'm not sure. Obviously, there's a lot competing there, but you know, I, I think it speaks volumes that it is something I would consider. And Portions for Foxes is not just the best song on the album. It's not just Lewis's best. It's it, it's just one of the best songs out there. I mean, it's this like wonderfully, triumphantly lugubrious ballad about self-hatred, self-loathing, about the sort of decisions you make when you're only focused on the immediate joy that you're going to feel and you're just kind of disregarding what's going to happen later. Blood in my mouth cause I've been biting my tongue all week I keep on talking trash but I never say anything The title comes from Psalm 63. David in the wilderness. David wants to follow God, to be in his will, but it's this painful, uncertain path for him. We all want connection, and we're so ready to choose someone, even someone we know is bad for us, if the alternative is being alone. Oh God, you are my God, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. And the loneliness leads to bad dreams, and the bad dreams lead me to calling you, and I call you and say, yeah. David has to lament and celebrate. He's consumed by his faith, but it's also ultimately the source of his strength and he doesn't know if it will consume him first or give him the power he needs to overcome his enemy. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. Yeah, we'll all be portions for foxes. I do the same thing, David. I get lonely too.
another goat, this time the Yale. And the Yale's deal is that their horns are prehensile. Um, this, is, this isn't a good power. The, the point of a horn is for it to be very strong, very robust. If you make it flexible, then suddenly it can't really be used for any normal horn things, most notably headbutting. So the idea here is that you could curl one horn back and keep it in reserve in case the other one breaks when you strike your opponent. But if you have a prehensile horn, the chances that that are going to happen is just, just much higher. Regardless, I do noticeably identify with this overpreparedness. It's just, um, I do spend a lot of my time trying to plan for every eventuality. I gotta give the Yale a point for that. Wolves can steal a person's voice. In fact, the text says, if it sees a man first, it takes away his power of speech and looks at him with scorn as victor over the voiceless. Just like that turn of phrase. They're capable of surviving on meat, earth, or wind, which is pretty cool. And it even claims that there are some Ethiopian wolves that are capable of flight, although it's some sort of sort of limited flight, much more like jumping very far, which sounds either like a speedrunning tech or what the Incredible Hulk does. In either case, cool. Wolves get an easy A. I am sometimes asked what I wish more people understood about history, and I'm of two minds about this. The first thing is that the past is a foreign country. It's real easy to look at a story or some sort of fragment from history and isolate something that seems like a familiar detail and then just impose that onto something contemporary. And this is rarely correct. You know, like when people say that the Romans were super gay when in fact they just had their own extreme sexual mores. Or people talking about the founding fathers of America creating a nation based around freedom when all of them either owned slaves or permitted that practice. So, generally speaking, I think people should be more cautious about identifying with people from the past. That said, I also feel very strongly that we should seek some sort of human connection, because the people back then, they're, they're real people. And there's always going to be some little human moment if you go digging far enough, finding sling bullets that say catch on them from Roman slingers, or in this case, the dog entry in the Aberdeen manuscript. Because while almost every single other animal in this entire book gets at most one illustration and some get none, the dog gets four. Dogs can close up wounds by licking them, and puppies are said to be able to cure internal injuries this way. So I guess, like, doctors should carry one of each? Um, the real power of the dog, though, is their mind, their cunning. They're said to be the only animals capable of love and recognizing their own name and reasoning by syllogism. Like, all dogs are friends. I see a dog. I see my friend. Woof, woof, woof. Some track beasts, some guard the sheepfold, and, you know, sometimes they'll gather 200 strong and create a military formation in order to dive behind enemy lines and rescue a ransomed king. You know, just dog things. In this story, a dog witnesses a murder and chooses to stay with their human, even until the murderer returns, attempting to look confident in order to ward off any suspicion. But the dog recognizes the man, and it specifically says, briefly abandons its doleful lament, taking up the arms of vengeance. Woof, the dog seizes the man by the throat. Woof, woof, it sings a pitiful song and brings the crowd to tears. After that, no one's really willing to take the guy's word over the dogs. With their combination of intelligence, virtue, and military acumen, dogs are on par with humanity. One day, they will replace us. S tier. The sheep gets three entries. Uh, they're separated based on our relationship with the animal. See, a sheep is tripartite because we regard males, females, and babies very differently. We use them very differently. So the U is placeful, placeful, placid, peaceful, <laughs> and uh, generally sort of calm animal, but does get super anxious before winter and starts eating up all the grass you can see. The male is said to be very strong and good at headbutting and gets like five different names, while the lamb's main power is the ability to recognize their mother from any distance, and the mother can recognize the lamb no matter how many there are. David Sedaris taught me that one good way of breaking the ice with a person from another culture is to ask them, what do your roosters say? In Germany, where the dogs bark vow, vow, and both the frog and the duck say quack, the rooster greets the dog with a hearty kikariki. Grecian roosters crow kidiaki, and in France they scream coco rico, which sounds like an order for one of those horrible pre-mixed cocktails with a pirate on the label. When told that an American rooster says cock a doodle do, my hosts look at me with disbelief and pity. According to the bestiary, if you were to ask a 12th century English monk the question, what do your sheep say, he might respond, 
Bala. Like the goat, the sheep has different facets, reflecting their different roles in human lives. For now, they get a B tier, but I will revise that when they stop exhausting themselves fighting one another and join forces against their actual oppressors. You have nothing to lose but your chains. The goat is so horny that his eyes point sideways, and so hot-tempered that his blood can melt diamonds. That's basically all there is to say about the passage in question, but I have a little bit more to say about goats in general, because my cousin recently asked me, why are goat eyes like that? And I thought this would be sort of a profound opportunity to share my process. All sort of herd living animals that are preyed upon have wide set eyes on the sides of their heads, and that's just to maximize their field of vision, because they don't care so much about seeing detail or judging distance as they do about seeing threats coming from as many angles at once. The question then is, are the pupils, which are the real weird part of the goat eye, important in that process? I mean, Theoretically, maybe they expand the field of vision by having a larger portal for light to get in. You would expect there to be a trade-off of some kind, because we don't see these wide pupils everywhere in nature. There's some advantage to having a round pupil, and I supposed at the beginning that it was probably visual acuity. My first surprise came when I learned that goats are not unusual. In fact, both horses and deer have these horizontal pupils. Most herd-living grazers do. I also failed to consider cats and vipers, who have vertical pupils. So these non-rounded pupils, they're found in both predators and prey species. For nearly a century, the explanation was purely geometric. See, the difference between the size of the smallest pupil and the most dilated pupil when they're round is about 15-fold. However, mandorla-shaped pupils, don't let anyone ever tell you a word is useless, those can increase by 300 times when they expand. This is actually the reason why cats have such good night vision. Same thing with deer. As it turns out, the axis the pupil is on affects acuity in a strange way that you probably won't be able to imagine. See, what it does is it actually changes the vertical blurriness for horizontal pupils and the horizontal blurriness for vertical pupils. The blur is directional, like this or this. And so, after just a little bit of digging, I found a good answer that's rigorous and well-supported in the body of research, and satisfying in its simplicity. Is what I would say if I was a punk. You never accept the first explanation you find, not if you care about actually getting to the bottom of something. In 2015, a team of Berkeley scientists dropped a paper that, frankly, and I hope I don't sound like I'm overstating this, completely shifts the paradigm on goat eye science. They didn't do this by refuting the previous stuff. Basically, everything I said before is still accurate, but there's just more to it. Specifically, we have this open question. Why do predators have vertical pupils, even not closely related ones, and prey have these horizontal pupils? What's the difference? How does the axis end up mattering? These kinds of predators and humans both have stereoscopic vision, or binocular vision, which is the main way that you're going to judge depth, depth perception. It's not the only way. It's not even the only way that a human might use. So. Something you can test right now, we're doing audience participation. Hey everyone, hey, we're doing audience participation now. Close one eye and look at an object, and then shift your head back and forth. You can see that an object that's further away moves relatively less, and an object that's nearby moves relatively more whenever you move your point of vision. This is called parallax, and it's something that you use all the time. But Animals like cats and vipers, they can't use this when they're focused on prey because it requires them to wiggle, which would give away their position. They need an alternative. Remember what I said about directional blurriness? Well, it turns out you can also tell the difference of how distant something is from your point of focus based on how blurry it is. So take your two fingers and put them at the same distance from your face, focus on the left, and then pull the right closer and closer. As it gets nearer to you, it'll go more and more out of focus. But if you look at it directly, it'll snap back in. Mandorla-shaped pupils keep one axis in focus, at least compared to the other. If your brain was wired to pay attention to that sort of detail, you'd be able to use it to judge relative distance. And of course, if you need to see detail, you could always just focus on the object you're looking at. What about goats, where our journey began? Well, they're doing a similar trade-off. They don't have as much visual acuity, but it turns out, one thing I completely forgot to think is, you know, goats don't want to be able to look up. The only thing up there is birds, which they don't care about, and the sun, which can blind them. The question, though, is, was I right in my initial supposition? Does a wider mandorla pupil provide more vision on the horizon line? The answer turns out to be probably yes, but there's something wrong with this hypothesis, and it's something you can figure out right now by looking at these two images. These are the same goat, so what's wrong with it? There's, there's something off here. You should be looking at the eye if that wasn't clear. Do you see it? That's right. The horizontal pupil remains parallel to the horizon even when the head tilts. Goat eyes can rotate on the Z axis. 
Is including that a mistake? <sighs> no. No, that was awesome. Get yourself into A tier. We're mostly done. Short entry, and one that really only contains etymological information. Um, I will give it a slight boost because I like pigs. Bullocks are castrated bulls, and I assume that is connected to the word bollocks, although, you know, there I go doing folk etymology. This book is a bad influence. The bullocks is stronger and faster than their betestacled counterpart. They're also immune to swords, and their horns are prehensile, which is a solid if unexciting package of powers, like Captain America. This long chapter has a lot of detail about horses' various colors and temperament, and how to appraise their value. I don't know, I'm not a horse girl. This one's, oh god, this is so beautiful, because it strongly implies that the illustrator thought the way that a knight would fight another knight is by riding up on a horse, getting off, and then sword fighting while their horses fight each other. <laughs> It does make one interesting reference to Genesis 30, which is the very fun story where Jacob pulls this elaborate multi-generational sheep con. He promises he'll give away all of the sheep in his herd that have one color to their coat. Then he breeds them in front of striped sticks, uh, with the idea that whatever the ram is looking at during copulation, that will affect the pattern of the coat of the lamb that is produced. Strangely, the Aberdeen makes reference to a very different version of the story. In this case, Jacob has the rams mate in front of water so they can see their own reflections. And that would work, right? It's just selective breeding at that point. Anyway, horses are inexplicably not attributed a single magical ability. I, that's wild. I'll give them exactly one point in the category because the passage makes reference to the Sinocephalus again, my boy, St. Christopher. The bestiary does not extend the same love to cats as it does to dogs. Um, it just says a bit about their etymology of their name and then moves on to mice. Allow me to fix that. Pungerban was a cat, and the subject of a 9th century Irish poem of the same name. The poem is honestly very beautiful and just kind of worth reading, maybe with a feline companion. Pungerban probably translates to fluffy white, so maybe you could change the bond to match whatever feline companion you've chosen. I do know two other old Irish cat names, Miana, which means little meow, and Kurivna, which translates to little paws. In fact, cats are strangely well attested in early Irish writings. The Laws of the Hewilva has an entire section on cat law, where it clarifies that a good mouser would be worth at least three cows, while an animal that's worse at that would still be worth one and a half, as long as it was a good purrer. This cat's name is Tibbert. His friend is named Renard. Lastly, what killed the cat? The proverb goes that it's curiosity, but it turns out that's a relatively recent change. Up until the early 19th century, it was care that killed the cat. Care in this sense being anxiety, worry, or grief. This older version of the word still exists. For example, to be careful doesn't mean to be compassionate, it means to be cautious, to avoid something that you're worried about. When you are carefree, it means that you have no worries, and if you don't care about something, it means it doesn't bother you. Cats have always struck me as unanxious creatures. They certainly have their likes and dislikes. They can be afraid, but I don't really picture them ever worrying about something that isn't at least somewhat present in the moment. So the question then is, did people feel differently about cats in the past? Or perhaps, were cats more anxious in the distant past? And if so, what changed? Maybe they took some advice from one Billy Shakespeare when he wrote, What courage, man! What though care killed a cat, thou hast meddle enough in thee to kill care. Cats have not always been our stalwart, indignant companions, and their duality with dogs is probably pretty recent. I still just never would have guessed they did this kind of brush off. I mean, like, this is all there is about cats. And most of it's about mice. Cats are pretty clearly S tier. Isidore, see me after class. The mouse is very small, and their liver changes sizes with the phases of the moon, which strikes me much more as a witch's curse than a superpower. Weasel, which Isidore claims means long mouse, and I, I really hope that's true, they're able to give birth out of their ears? This strikes me as another witch's curse, but thankfully it's not their only power. They're also very intelligent. Or, well, that's how I interpret it. What the passage specifically says is they are cunning because they carry their... Well, actually, now what is a baby weasel called? They carry their kittens from place to place to show them the world. Like, here's a castle. These are some snakes. This is how you wrongle a cockatrice to death. You go for the neck, you go for the groin. Don't care how big it is, kids. These are our enemies, and we will destroy them. Maybe not that one. 
It seems we have weasels to thank for ridding the world of the cockatrice. They are the people's champion, and well deserving of a spot near the top. A tier. I like moles, and since this is my channel, I'm gonna just say it. It's the official stance of this channel that we like moles, and if the Aberdeen can't think of anything nice to say about them, I'm gonna turn to friend of the channel, Pliny the Elder, who wrote, Moles have very keen hearing, even buried in the earth. They can overhear people talking, and will run away if they hear people talking about them. Relatable. For some reason, medieval writers were convinced that hedgehogs used their quills to store fruit. Sometimes it's apples, sometimes it's figs, in this case it's grapes. Regardless, the method is always the same. They sort of scruffle into the tree, knock the fruit out of it, and then roll backwards onto it. To what point and purpose? You got me. They have one other power, which is that they can breathe out of two different organs, not specified. You could reasonably guess that it's their ears, but given the wacky shit we've seen, you know, it's the mouth and the butt, right? You know that it's the mouth and the butt. This sounds at first like another witch's curse, but it's not, because the understanding of medicine at this time was built around humoral theory, which maintained that diseases were caused by bad air, and therefore the ability to close yourself off to harmful breezes would mean you were immune to any kind of airborne illness. And for some reason, that sounds like a really appealing power to me. I love the image of these little cuties gathering fruit. It's quite diminished by the fact that most fruit is toxic to hedgehogs, especially grapes. Um, don't feed animals anything unless you have to see that animal can eat that thing. Hedgehogs, I'd put you higher. This is not personal. I just have to set an example for responsible animal care. B tier. Go to the ant, you lazy bones. Consider her ways and be wise. Proverbs 6.6. 6. For the ant has no knowledge of cultivation, it has no one to force it to do anything. Nor does it act under the direction of a master, telling it how to lay in a store of food. Yet it gathers in its harvest from your labors. And although you often go hungry, it lacks for nothing. It has no locked storehouses, no impenetrable security, no piles of supplies which cannot be touched. The watchman looks on at the thefts which he dares not prevent. The owner is aware of his losses, but takes no revenge. He blushes with shame at the thought of denying such frugal gains won by such conscientious industry. Okay. The ant is the last of the wild beasts, and that might sound wrong to you, but maybe you'll be comforted by knowing that they've been sinofabulated into dogs on three separate occasions. Next time we'll be talking about birds and discussing which of them are actually fish. Really? You forgot the sign-off? That's in every video. Whatever. Huge thanks to anyone who watched this whole thing. I got this really nice comment a while ago. Thank you for that. Hey, do you want to see more of my stuff? Join my Patreon. I post drafts of my videos and you can give me feedback. I don't promise to take all of your advice, but I'll listen. And you get to see the final version early too. I also create these Animal Corner fact sheets. They're like mini Animal Corners with no animations. They are my own illustrations though. And if you join at $10 a month, I'll make one for you based on whatever animal you choose. Thank you to Audrey, Sam, Ryan, NotNets, Fab, and Yolanda. You made it this video and all the ones that will come after it possible.